And here we go. All right, welcome everybody to the week four virtual office hour session. Uh, and I've got Carrie and Jamie with me on tonight. Uh, as always, we will, uh, once the recording is ready, uh, worst case scenario by tomorrow morning, we will provide the recording for those who are not here to be able to to partake of the of the discussion at hand. So we are going to dive right in. Uh, Carrie and I were just talking. Jamie, I think this is going to be a light week. It's very, very, uh, uh, there, there's not a lot to do, not a lot to read, not a lot of work to do per se. Uh, so we're just going to dive in. We think this is going to go pretty quickly. So you guys control the tempo. Uh, I might have a couple things to say before we wrap up, but uh, does anybody have any questions tonight? I was just curious about a few little things in different measures um, for usability studies. So one of the questions that I had is so you, you can measure both success. Someone could have like success with a task but have multiple errors. So you would get a success rate and an error. Oh, oh and Carrie, sorry to cut you off. It's happening again. It almost oh, sounds muffled. It's clear. I, I don't know. It's muffled. I don't know. Me. Sorry. It yeah, it's going back and forth between being clear and being muffled. Okay, sorry about that. I'll I'll defer to Jamie and let um do you have any questions? I don't know what's wrong with my mic or my connection. Jamie, did you have anything? Oh, oh no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay, let, let's try again, Carrie. But uh, I, I'm not sure what it could be causing that. Yeah, what the issue is, can you, can you hear me now, Derek? Is that better? I can hear you, but right before you said, can I hear you, it happened again. I heard the muffling. So let, let's give it a shot, and I'll, I'll, I'll reconfirm, make sure I'm understanding it. Okay. Yeah, I apologize. I'm not sure what the issue is. It looks like my internet's okay. I, I was just wondering, with success rate and error rate, they're not mutually exclusive. And what I mean by that is, so someone could succeed at the task but make multiple errors. So, you know, you would get a success rate for different users, but then there could be a high error rate even though they did complete the task. Is that is that correct? That is that is absolutely correct. And and very, very perceptive, yes. And you have to when you're making your decision as to which one of these metrics or measurements you'd like to report on, you want to take something like that into consideration. What what do you think the stakeholders will benefit from the most? I mean, every like you said, everybody could, another factor, everybody could, you could have a 100% success rate, but you could have errors, and then there's a lot of annoyance that happens even though they were successful. Just because somebody's successful doesn't mean they're happy. So little things like that are would be good to take into consideration. So if you only um, if you only report a success rate without error rate, that could really lead to erroneous conclusions because the yep. you know stakeholders to be like, ah, everyone's successful with this, but the users hate it because they had to like, it was only the resilience that got them through this horrible, uh, exactly. you know, happen. Exactly. Yep. Cool. And I guess the only other question I have with those, um, is it just, I just want to confirm, is it just never a good idea to use time on task as a measure if you're using a talk of protocol? No, I, I love time to task um, because if you benchmark and find out, say say you have a current, say the, the, a current version of the site is when people are trying to perform a, a particular task and say the task is the point of focus and going through, you had average time on task of 28 seconds and then you find out that people are struggling, consistently struggling with a particular part of the task flow, you change that and now the time on task comes back at an average of 18 seconds. 
or say 12 seconds, that's huge. And and if you're uh, say if you were, I think the the solution that you're looking at is going to determine how much benefit you get from measuring time on task. At where we're working now, if we can save five seconds on a task, and the the users are performing this task 780 times a day. You see the time savings, and then you monetize it. And not only can you illustrate how much you're going to, uh, how much time you're going to save the the team members that are uh, that are performing these tasks, but you're also going to be able to demonstrate the return on investment associated with UX. So time on task can be extremely valuable, but again, it depends on the scenario whether or not that might be the most advantageous metric to report on. So that's I, very important. Right? Beyond, beyond, beyond looking at whether they need a benchmark, what you're actually looking at is relative improvement in task from pre to post design sheet, which could be like very influential. Yep. Which I never thought of that. Yep. Very cool. I love that. I mean, uh, we, we have been looking at user zoom lately. And um, one of the things, and we looked at user uh, usertesting.com as well, and they both report time to task automatically. So it was nice to be able to see that. Can you guys hear me okay? I just saw my uh, something. You know, it might be something going on with me, although I was hearing Jamie pretty clearly. I just saw. Hey, uh, I can't hear you perfectly. So I think the issue might have been on my end. I just went off. I just had a weird little indicator pop up on my screen that is gone now. Uh, so hopefully we're okay. Um, the To be able to see, have people complete tasks and every task, uh, with every task, both of those solutions provided time to task for both. It, in some cases, we had to throw it out because you could hear people being interrupted. They weren't taking the tests in an isolated area. And so people were at their desk and folks were walking up to them and asking questions. So we had to take some of it with a grain of salt. But if we had some um, some moderated sessions, say, in in a user a user testing lab, and people are focusing solely on that task, it was it's good to be able to see that everybody got through the process in 45 seconds. And so now we we can see how efficient it is, and and then we would go back and make changes and. And, and try to cut some time off of that because the whole time is money bit. So I, I love being able to get time to task. The uh, Another key factor that might play uh, come into play with all the students in this class is that you don't have user uh, testing.com or user zoom. You're going to be doing this pretty much uh, manually. So that means if you're going to do time to task, you're going to have a stopwatch out. So you want to take that into consideration as well. Do you really, do you really want to do that X number of times? So keep that in mind. I mean, if you, if that's where you get the benefit, then you're going to do it no matter what. But uh, some people would find that very frustrating and a little too labor intensive. Can you use Zoom, use your Zoom um, or user testing .com to do moderate? Um, usability, you know, remotely. And then yes. Them. Okay, you can. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, you absolutely can. And then you have some of the, those are some of your higher end applications from a price point perspective. You have um, some of the more inexpensive ones where you pay by the test, such as Try My UI. Um, there's another one, Loop 11. I believe has a a per test model also so you're not shelling out thirty thousand dollars forty thousand dollars that's what you're going to pay pretty much if you use other solutions and yeah, I, I, no, go on. I'm sorry, man. I I have only been able in, in my career um, I have never been able to get we got user Zoom approved, and then they pulled it off the table, and they wanted to talk about it some more. So this would have been the first time that 
we actually started with nothing and almost got user zoom the contract signed um i had i presented one company i worked for a nameless company and i tried to get uh, approval for usertesting.com and when they saw the price they just said oh my god no and i ended up using usability hub but it's a, it's a different animal for the most part with usability hub so and the, the price point was only $700 $800 for the whole year but you're not getting the same things that you're getting with with user testing and uh user zoom so it's 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 it, the field is becoming a little crowded, but user zoom and user testing by far, uh, in my opinion, are at the uh, head of the class with those solutions. Yeah, I'm going to do some usability testing for a project at work, and we have a remote group course, and this is actually an internal application that we're designing. We're actually redesigning, and um, I wanted to do some remote moderator. I was going to be a moderator, but you know, I was thinking about if I could use one of those applications, I'd be the moderator that it would capture some metrics for me, you know, rather than having to do all of the capturing of the metrics myself as well as moderating. Yeah. I'm just trying to kind of moderate. Yep. Yep. There it's great to be able to do that and the speed. Which, with which I remember when I worked for Cengage Learning, we would, we would, you, you can actually source your own participants or you can use their panels. And you would have your screener to make sure that you only have people participating in the test that match the demographics of your users. Um, we would have a meeting in the morning, decide that we needed data on X, Y, and Z conduct the test, design the test, roll it out, and have uh, data by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> That's pretty sweet. <laughs> Trustworthy, reliable data. And it just it does not get any more beautiful than that. And I'm, I'm, I'm UX nerding out on it, but it's, it's fantastic. And at the time, we were redesigning the National Geographic Learning uh, English as a Second Language. Uh, online uh, solution. Oh, wow. We would, I would do a design, roll it out, get 10, 15 people, boom, done. And and be able, by the time we met with the team at the end of the day, we would be able to show, okay, this is what we found out. This works, this tested well. So, and then i throw a little tidbit in here. I don't know how much this is going to help with the assignment, but this, so this is just a, a professional tidbit. Um, I am a staunch believer in heuristics. And so I design, I, I always feel when I'm teaching courses, uh, not here, we don't have a heuristic analysis course here yet. Uh, but when I teach, when I run my workshops here locally in Detroit, in the Detroit area, um, I always tell people that heuristics should be the first tool out of the UXers toolbox. And so I designed with heuristics in mind. And when we went to test the designs, um, it was funny. I started out with low, low fidelity wireframes and it turned into uh, high fidelity wireframes with, and the, the creative team did not have to make many changes to roll out the final. So we were able to test something that was either mid or high fidelity and with everything was designed with it from a heuristic perspective and we, we rocked it. So the, we were actually able to do the test and because the heuristics were applied up front, we were able to pretty much, uh, we were able to reduce the, uh, the time required to deliver the final product. So just a little tidbit. It I'm, seems like, I don't know how many people design with heuristics in mind, but I do. I, I would think too, and correct me if I'm wrong, but with usability testing, like it's it's great to be able to report like success rate or errors, but without heuristics or an understanding of that, how would you even be able to know why they're making their mistakes or where the issue is occurring? Uh, you would hope people would have some degree of expertise to understand and 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 
it's it's going to be more old. Oh, people were struggling with the button. The the person may or may not have may not be able to real they may not realize that that's a heuristic element that they're looking at. As long as you can say, hey, people were struggling with the button. Hey, it took pe- people it took them eight clicks, and and I do not believe in click counting at all. Um, but if it took them eight clicks, the question is, is it possible? Don't still don't count the click, but is it possible? Did we did we make this 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 task flow too labor intensive? Can we make can we streamline it? I'd rather look at it from that perspective as opposed to I'm trying to reduce the clicks from eight to five. That's pretty silly, and and you put in the you're putting the cart before the horse if you do that. The question is, can I make the flow more efficient? You want to ask yourself that question. Can I make the path more delightful? Ask that question. Don't say, hey, I want to go from eight clicks to five. If a person, if, if you can go from eight to five, but you still, if you're, if you're being responsible, you still have to ask the question, is this as efficient as possible? Because I can, some, I can watch somebody take, some, take a path from eight clicks to five and then hand it to me. I might get it down to three because I'm focusing on efficiency instead of counting clicks. And, and I've seen people celebrate because they were able to reduce clicks and you still haven't done anything. Someone um, shared a a um, a website today and I also am, I'm very anti-medium. There's a lot of, of terrible things on medium regarding UX. It's become the the it's become Death Valley UX Death Valley, if you will. Uh, if you go to Medium reading articles, I found out that there are people who have been tasked by their boot camp to write UX articles as part of their coursework. So you've got people who have no idea what they're talking about, and they're posting to Medium in droves. Yeah, everyone's an expert. It's terrible, absolutely terrible. And so someone posted; they had an article. Where they were, and it was called um, micro interactions, something or other. And they were trying to share examples of good micro interactions, and the things that they shared weren't micro interactions. You know that, that kind of stuff. That that's just oh god, it was terrible. And and, and some of them bring value. So I don't care if you said it was a good micro interaction. Nobody got. Not got a video. Somebody signed up for they they selected a flight through an airline, and when they finished selecting the flight, the plane was pointing up like as if it was going straight up like a space shuttle. And then when you finish, which was silly in the first place, and then when the person finished the process, the plane leveled off. That is that really efficient? Does that really match mental models? Does that does that match how people perceive things happening with planes? Uh, the answer is no. So they thought that it was a great micro interaction, and it was actually uh, adding to cognitive load by putting a confusing a confusing type of uh, illustration up there, trying to illustrate success. Just let them know that they were successful. Show them a check mark. Do something else. Something simple. Something that's common convention. But don't show a plane. That appears to be a space shuttle changing whether it's horizontal or vertical. That's not that's not common convention. So well, those kind of things are happening. And that, and that article was on Medium. And I decided I, I chose not to address it with the with the team. I didn't bring it up. I'll I'll address it later. Bring it up and point it out and let them see it because people don't like expertise. Even UXers don't like expertise a lot of times. So. I'll, I'll pick my battles and I'll address that another time. Another time. <laughs> would you would you be able either now or you know you don't have to do it off the top of your head, but would you be able to recommend some good resources to really learn heuristics? Heuristics. Uh, there's one thing we can do, and I will show everybody here right now. It will send you on your way. Uh, I did a talk. Uh, just log in here. And don't you love this? I just logged in the slide share, right? It still asks me to log in. Now I'm going to reload the page. Watch this. Voila. Hey, Abracadabra. 
and now I'm logged in. Uh, this is really weird. They have a huge UX team, and nobody has ever caught that. Uh, anyway, here, if you go to my uploads, uh, and you see, uh, should be here. Yeah, there it is. Uh, there's a, a talk that I did called Heuristics, the Holy Grail of UX. And so you can go through this without hearing me talk about it. And you can learn some things about heuristics. And uh, it's really more so once you get to slide 14 forward is when you start to learn some things about heuristics, different schools of thought about heuristics. And by the way, the uh, Abby Covert and Tug model that you see here is the one that I recommend. Everybody will usually refer to Jacob Nielsen, which was written in about 1993, somewhere around there. Uh, and so you got to know that's almost 30 years ago. Uh, so this is outdated. Uh, it, it's a good place to start and it helps you to get some understanding. However, uh, it's easier to apply this one. And they have some fantastic questions that help you to uh, overcome the temptation, if you will, for lack of a better word, to be subjective because heuristics are not subjective. They have to be, they are proven principles, best practices, common convention. That's what heuristics revolve around. So the better somebody is with heuristics, the more you're going to get done. I mean, it, I, one of the things I always cringe about is when people are conducting UX research and they test something that's already heuristically proven. So you just wasted time, money, resources. If you if you know heuristics, and I believe there's a slide here that addresses this. Uh, this is something that Jacob Nielsen, I might as well blow this up so you can see it. Lo, can you guys see that okay? Yeah. So according to Jacob Nielsen, uh, Jamie, can you see this? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, good. Uh, Jacob Nielsen stated that five evaluators can find 70% of issues in a design. He never, he never elaborated about certain things. So I'm going to interject some things. Five evaluators can find 70%. What if you're working on a redesign? So that means that you can, you can bring this heuristic evaluation into play before you really get started with the redesign and you can find out all the low hanging fruit that you need to improve up front. You're going to make it more efficient. And I don't have to test about those 70%. My research should revolve around this other 30%. Something else to note here, and the controls are in my way, so I couldn't see it. 10, and this is a generic, by the way, the way that he's presenting this, and I'll explain what I mean in a moment. If you have 10 evaluators, you can find approximately 90% of issues, which means that your research will be mainly focused on that additional 10%. And if you need to, for politics sake, you might need to conduct some research on the other part that you already know. But if uh, the that will depend upon the UX maturity level of the organization where you're working. If they trust you, they're going to just focus on this. They'll, you, you can focus on this part. If they don't trust your recommendations, you're going to have to include all this other stuff. And it is a waste, but you have to do it because of the politics and the, the uh, lower UX maturity level in the organization. Now, here's the part that Jacob Nielsen never talked about. He just said five can find you 70 and 10 can find you approximately 90. Number one, these people are all supposed to be experts. So if the five people that are performing the heuristic analysis are not experts, they're not going to find 70%. It's going to be down here 20, 30, if that. Their 10 are not going to find. If they're not skilled, they're not going to find approximately 90%. It's going to be something more around the 40 to 50%. And that's just off the top of my head. So these numbers will shift based on the, the amount of expertise. Me. I can find 90% by myself, but I've been, I mean, I've been around for a while, so it's a little different. But the, that's one thing that's never brought up in this model. It never talked about the, the, the amount of expertise that the evaluators have 
one of the reasons why that's critical is that today you have people that are not experts trying to perform heuristic analyses and they're not supposed to be doing that at all. Those people are going to have to conduct research because they can't look at something and spot it. I can I can look at something and I've always had my best interviews and some of my best um, episodes, if you will, have been when I completely ripped the design to shreds because I found everything strictly based on heuristics, no research, and was able and and I saw things that nobody could see. Um, anything from clicking on a a logo on a home page that just reloads the home page that provides no value from that to uh placing critical information in the lower right hand portion of the screen that's that's a heuristic we know that people look at things in an f shaped pattern and so whatever is in this bottom right hand corner is the thing that's going to get missed more so than anything else even if you look at heat maps uh, or if you look at gaze maps from, from from eye tracking, this area is usually the area where people don't look. So we so that means that's a heuristic. So so if you, and the more you research something else that I'm I'm designing a heuristic analysis course at work now, and one of the things I let people know is that everybody has a personal heuristic repository. Where do you stand personally? with regard to your heuristic expertise. And your heuristic, your heuristic repository, your expertise, continues to grow, to, to grow as you evolve as a UX professional. So you, you gain knowledge of more and more and more heuristics, and you're able to apply those heuristics as you work on more and more projects going forward. So you get faster and faster and faster, and you save more and more and more time and money because of the size of your heuristic repository. Does that all make sense? Yeah, I mean, that's really what I want to work to build is you know, my heuristic repository. So I mean, this presentation looks really awesome. Thank you. Yep. I'm trying to see where's my, I can't see my whole screen here. Sorry, here it is. The go to meeting controls are in the way. I'm going to move them over to the side. Uh, so there is uh, heuristics in action. So we bring up this, it's, it's not just, Relegated to or limited to digital, uh, this they show a plane ticket from Lestanza, and I have, have some notes there. Uh, Mailchimp, uh, these are the, I, I should back up. The, the way these are all listed, I actually listed out uh, several types of heuristics that come from the models that I showed earlier, and these were discussed when I delivered the talk. So this page might not make sense because the narrative is not included. Uh, then we. Uh, also did it again with the Lego site, and this is where we had a lot of fun. I'll skip over Macy's. They have upgraded the Zappos site since we did this, but um, in this exercise, I asked people who attended the talk if they could, we would walk through it together. What would you do to find yoga pants? Asterisk, you can't use the search. How would you find the yoga pants? And and every time we did this, nobody could ever find yoga pants. They would I, I would drive and people would talk me through it. And uh, come to find out that yoga pants are the only way you could find them is through the search. You couldn't find them. The the you had some heuristic issues with the global navigation on the site with the information architecture. They had the information sense were not there. You you just couldn't find anything. And they changed it. Now you can actually find yoga pants via the navigation. So it's sort of funny. Somebody found that out. So I'm assuming they've got some UX folks <laughs> on staff there. So here's the uh, we, here's the uh, the the uh, the drop down mega menu, uh, and and you can't. I have to blow this up again. Uh, you really can't tell <laughs> by anything here. Uh, and I can't remember if someone tried to go through athletic and you still couldn't find it. So there was absolutely no way to find the yoga pants. So that's a heuristic issue. Then we wrapped up. What is a heuristic? Uh, rules of thumb come into play. Best practices, common sense, intuitive judgments. They didn't mention some of the other elements. This came from Abby Covert. 
uh, also. Uh, and then this is what I actually devised this one. If you want to apply heuristics, first you need to learn what they are. You need to exercise. You need to perform heuristic analyses on a regular basis, even if it has nothing to do with your work. Just perform heuristic analyses so you can sort of build your muscles up, so to speak, regarding it, so you can get good at it. And then you engage in continued education about heuristic analyses. Make sure that you inject scenarios. Always, and when you're performing a heuristic analysis, you need a story to go along with it so you can make sure that you're following a, a natural flow of things as opposed to just willy-nilly conducting the, the analysis. It'll, it'll, it'll be more fruitful if you, if you do it associated with a scenario. That means you're going to have to come up with 30, 40, 50 scenarios to perform the analysis. Not, not, not two or three. This is something that you do on a regular basis. Um, and then that's it. And I believe there are some, did I have any resources? No, I didn't have any resources. So I'm going to show you one more thing that will help with regard to heuristics. I'm going to go to Amazon and show you the book that changed my life from a UX perspective. And people um, don't be swayed by the reviews on this book. Uh, this is a relative, this, this book was written, it was published in 2001. So you would think that why in the world do I want to see that now? Um, and it only has a three and a half stars. Someone gave it one star because they say it's outdated. Well, we know it's outdated because it was published in 2001. So duh, that, that's, <laughs> that's, people don't know how to, how to conduct reviews, how to, how to give reviews. So you have to take this stuff with a grain of salt. The reason I'm recommending this book, and you can't look in this book, they don't have that feature live. I highly recommend this book uh, because it shows you, if you want to know, if you want a shortcut, how to perform a heuristic analysis, get a, get a used version of this book. You don't have to pay $24 for this book, and it doesn't come in, um, you can't buy it for Kindle. Uh, but this book was selling for like two, three dollars. All of a sudden, the price is going back up, even for the used, the used versions. The, the cheapest one you can get is five dollars and 72 cents. This book has some dynamite examples. And to this day, when I perform a heuristic analysis, I structure my reports the same exact way that Jacob Nielsen did in this book. It changed my career. I bought this book when it first came out in 2001 and i've been following the protocol the the example the way that he structured this book ever since then so i've been using this using this approach for 19 years and it has never failed me i wish there was a um i'm going to try and see if there is an example if not one day i can show you guys an example a different way let's see a home page usability nielsen let's see my hunch is that there are some examples in here, I'm hoping, and it looks like there are not. Nope, no examples from the book. So, so much for that. I'll try one more thing. I was not trying to do that. Let's just get rid of that because that's just going to create a problem. Let's try one more thing. Uh, I'm going to add the word example and nothing. So, nope. So that means we'd have to buy the book or I would have to actually uh, scan a page from the book and show it to you. Or if we if this comes up another time, I promise to show you um, one of the old heuristic reports that I did. And that'd probably be the best way to do it. We, we won't have time to do it tonight. We're already at 9.39. But any other questions? And uh, if not, then I'm just going to touch on some couple things with the uh, assignment. I always like to go over the rubric. Are you guys all set? That was I don't have any questions. Okay. So let's just jump to the rubric, and then we'll call it a night. Remember, you're going to the Chipotle site. I had it up here just in case anybody needs to see it. Those look like giant prescription pills to me. Um, I, I can't look at that. It would drive me crazy. 
So <laughs> uh, you're going to use a Chipotle sign. I wish there was a way to turn that off. Uh, they obviously didn't test that. That's a very annoying uh, illustration. But uh, the rubric states you need to justify which method, which quantitative method you selected. So don't just select something. And that's something that, that did happen. Uh, I, I am catch, still playing catch up with your with your grades. I hope to make huge progress um, tomorrow night. I've dedicated to trying to get trying to get caught up with everything. So be on the lookout for additional grades tomorrow. Um, but one of the things that I did notice in week one in particular was that people are not looking at the rubric and then making sure you're accounting for everything. Uh, one of the big omissions was that everybody was supposed to include two references. And then when you, um, I looked at a lot of assignments and people were, some people didn't have any references and people had one reference. And then some people would have references, but they would include them at a certain part of the paper, but you're supposed to list references at the end. Uh, you're not supposed, you're supposed to, to uh, cite them within your your paper, but you list them at the end. So I'm going to provide a reference later for the Purdue OWL. Uh, matter of fact, I'm going to bring it up here now so we can have it. People can see it on the video. A little typo there, but we should still find it. If you go to OWL, that's Online Writing Lab. That's what it stands for. OWL.purdue.edu. And if you go to this site and look up the APA guide, which is the one that I recommend for academic work, uh, and you have information here that lets you know research and citation resources. And would you actually go down to AP, APA style, that'd be the best one. Um, formatting and style guide, uh, it was also here. Uh, so it's not, let me click that, please load. And you have, you can actually cite your, you can actually enter the information in here and uh, it's powered by Citation Machine, which is a, another nice resource. It will generate your reference for you and then you just copy it and paste it into your, into your paper. But don't, don't be haphazard. You don't want to, this is something that you are going to definitely need to be good at at the master's level. Uh, I, I, any, any students that I have that don't understand how to list references, I always bring this up. Make sure that this stuff is solid. You do not want to um, be in a case where you don't know how to present your reference materials, whether it's citing it within your, the way you cite it in line with your paper and then the way you list it at the end. There, there's a, a specified way to do it. Uh, I've had people who, uh, have argued with me about which style to use. APA is the most predominant in, in an academic setting. So I'm asking you to do that. The school doesn't require it. I'm just trying to give you some structure. I went ahead and let that person do it whatever they, they whatever way they want it. And they're going to end up finding out later uh, that they should have done it this way. If you want to argue with me, fine. Fine. <laughs> I have no <laughs> then you go on and have a, have a ball. Uh, and, you know, we're trying to help everybody succeed. And when people come at you as as if you're a an enemy, it's hard to help people. I'm just going to be candid and just say that. But I recommend APA because you'll get further with this from an academic perspective. If anyone decides that I'm not stopping at a master's, I want a PhD, they are going to demand APA. And if you say anything back to them and argue with them, uh, they are simply going to flunk you. The, the higher up you go in this academic uh, world, the more stringent things become. So at the bachelor's level, the undergrad level, certain things are tolerated. At the master's level, we weed all of that out. And and at the doctoral level, you pretty much, all we do is write and, and uh, conduct research all the time. That's all I've been doing in all my classes. And if you play with them or get fussy with them, they will shut you down. They have no problem spitting you, chewing you up and spitting you out. And somebody said, that's really rough. Then you don't go to, you don't get a doctoral degree. <laughs> 
that they're, they're, they're not playing and we're paying too much money for uh, instructors to be haphazard. So that's the mindset. So as, as an instructor, I can appreciate that. But this is what I recommend people use. So dive in there, um, check it out every once in a while. Uh, be aware of this, what happens when you use citation generators because they don't always do things correctly. So uh, keep that in mind. If you, you find a guide here that tells you you should do it a particular way and the citation generator didn't do that, make sure you edit the, the citation that was generated so that you can list it the right way. Don't, don't be so dependent on the generator that you take it um, verbatim with what it presents. Make sure you evaluate what it does. So that said, um, you're going to select the one way you would present this information whether it's going to be in a table, graph, other, there's uh, other ideas listed here. Um, define your limitations of the quantitative method that you selected. So the cons, you want, you, want to, you want to list those out. You want to demonstrate that you have a clear understanding of quantitative usability methods. And then, of course, we're looking at spelling and grammar, craft, things of that nature. You want to be as professional in your presentation as you possibly can. You have a total of 10 points for this lesson. So is everybody clear there? Absolutely, thanks. Yep. Good. We are at 946. If you guys are good, we're gonna call in tonight. Thanks a lot, Darren, that's great. And any questions? Yeah, I'm good. Yep, any questions, by all means, uh, just let me know. And uh, we'll do what we can to, um, do what we can to help you out. One thing for you, Jamie, I'm gonna, uh, well, I'll say this online. There, we have a um, an IT career fair coming up soon at United Shore. Just in case you're, oh, if you'd like to come out, uh, I know <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely would be able to. I've been waiting six months for a new position, it still hasn't came through yet, so I'm getting impatient. <laughs> so, I will I'll get that information to you because I don't know how many other people in the class might be. Uh, local. Uh, I'll get that information mm -hmm. so you can come out. I'm not going to be there, but but uh, uh, I, I just want to make make that. Um, I want to publicize that for those who might be interested in in trying. To yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. Okay. All right, folks. That is it. Uh, I am going to go and chill because I have a ridiculously crazy week and I need to go lay down. <laughs> I need to lay down. I, I, I will be, uh, Carrie, you're not in the Cleveland area, are you? You know, I was up until this year, and uh, my wife took a job in Indianapolis, and I work remotely, and uh, we're actually moving to New York City at the end of this month. Oh, wow. So, okay. Cool. Cool. Away from Cleveland. Okay. Uh, so I will just say this, one other thing, I guess, for the class, uh, anyone who's interested in meeting me, I will be on campus speaking at World IA Day at Kent. So uh, I already have folks who know I'm coming and we'll be sitting around having lunch together and uh, and uh, just talking shop down there face to face, not just uh, virtually. So just wanted to extend that invitation to everybody. Uh, so I hope to see folks at World IA Day. And if you're not in the Cleveland area, uh, check the World IA Day site. You more than likely will be able to find an event in your area that day, and they're usually very good events, and it's worth it to attend. So I highly recommend that people go to World IA Day. The World Usability Day will be in November, same thing. Make sure to chime in there as well. All right, folks, have a good evening. I'll be on the lookout for any uh, messages, and I will get back to grading on tomorrow. All right, have a good one. Night. Bye-bye.